So Patrice, a very, a very warm welcome back to MOOC Plus Plus, and we're very much looking forward to your talk. With that, you <laughs> have this. Very stage. sweet. You're very sweet, my friend. <clears throat> so I, I'm hoping you see my screen. Yeah. Cool. We do. And I'm still hoping that you can see this. So this is probably okay. I I have hesitated for a long while as to whether I was going to use slides or live coding or both. I'm thinking I'm going to do a mix of both. So I have this thing there that I'm hoping you can see now. I'm going to be using very plain slides because I wanted the code to, to show up and I didn't find any theme that suited my fancy. So maybe at a later date, I'm going to make it better or something, but it's going to be black and white today. So no uh, no no swords and, and, and colors and, and stuff. Well, a bit of color as you'll see. The idea, <clears throat> suppose the following situation, you are, trying to display 60 images per second. Now, there's a difference between 60 images per second and an image every 1 60th of a second. The display that you have right there uh, on your screen, and I'm hoping that your screen, you can show, you can see this, the slide numbers there. Maybe you can, because I'm trying to move things around. Yeah, hopefully it works. So yeah, so uh, this should, if we have a proper prepare image and display image, uh, functions, uh, we should be able to see 60 images per second because we're displaying something in a cycle of, uh, of one over 60 seconds, which you can see on the second uh, line there if you look at where my, my mouse is moving. This, this is uh, what I would call regular execution in the sense that you will get your 60 images per second if the sum of the computation you do within an iteration of the loop takes less than 1 60th of a second overall. You have a sleep for remaining time at the end, which we'll return to. Um, so supposing that we're preparing stuff and then displaying, this will be regular in the sense that even though you have 60 images per second, you might have an unpleasant display of pictures because the moment where you're calling display in your loop, might move in terms of the portion of the 60th of a second when you're calling the function, depending on the time where prepare image completes. When we look at code like this, we're going to have a, an OK display, but maybe not a fluid display. It looks like this if you simplify the code. So while you're not done, you're preparing, you're displaying, this is not optimal in terms of fluidity. If you do it this way, you prepare the first image and then you display at the beginning of the cycle your image, then you prepare the next one and you have some time to sleep. You're going to display your image at the fixed point in time in your iteration cycle. And this is what I will call constant, uh, con constant rate. At the same point in time, every iteration of your cycle, you're going to be doing the same thing. Now, this is just a setup. So when you're doing real-time systems, you're not trying to go fast, you're trying never to go too slow. So of course, going fast is a good thing in most cases, but not going too slow is more important. We're, we're minded, uh, our, our mindset normally is we want to be fast, we want to have uh, a better throughput in our code, we want uh, to get more data out in a given time span. But real-time systems are not about that. They're about respecting constraints and not missing out. So if you're very good on average, but you're missing one key thing at some point, you might kill someone and that's bad. So the, the CRIB lines that I put there are, I think, uh, cover most of the uh, constraints that we see in such systems. So sometimes being regular is sufficient. That's the R thing. One, uh, 60 times per second would fit there. Constant rate is a bit tighter. I mean, at the same point in your cycle, every time you're going to do something like display an image at a very fluid rate. Sometimes you want to be low latency. I have an S3 I there, I'm sorry. So you want things to start very quickly once an event happens. So you want the beginning of a task to be at a very low latency past the event. And sometimes you want to optimize and just want to be brief. You want things to stop quickly. Okay. So I'm going to pay attention to that C thing there today, uh, but I'm not going to be paying attention to, to how to go quickly because the, the theme is to make things go slower in order to go faster in a sense. So if you look at this, I'm, I'm actually concerned about that thing there in, in boldface. 
sleeping is not always unreasonable, but you're suspending your computation for some time in order to start the next iteration of the fixed point, say. Wasting time. So if you could be using that time for something interesting, uh, that doesn't hamper your ability to perform the task in your loop at the fixed point. Well, the overall system could be better because the code you will, the, the, the effort you will invest instead of sleeping there to prepare stuff for the future in your code will make it so that when you reach the point where you need that thing, well, it's going to be available. You won't need to compute it then. So it's an economical choice to use that time to do something interesting. But what could we do with this? Because sometimes you look at this and say, well, yeah, OK, fair. But what could I do there that's interesting? I work a lot with game programmers. So these people, um, they're trying to make the coolest game ever, and they're trying to throw as many pictures as they can on the screen. I don't think it's that wise. I mean, at past some point, the human eye won't make the difference. If you can use your time to do something interesting, though, well, your overall game will be much more fun. I like games where you can walk for a long time and you never have a loading screen or something. These are awesome. When you need to stop the game and load something, that annoys me to no end because I stopped playing. It's just boring to me. So we could do things. We could decompress images to prepare them for <clears throat> later use and later display. We could prepare things that we will uh, play in the, the, the speakers of your computer. We could prefetch things doing I.O. if we could do that without interesting code. That's cool. So maybe you want to sleep. Maybe you have nothing to do. But if you have things to do, doing them in that time span where you would be sleeping in naive code, you might end up with a more fluid system and more fun. So let's try to do something with this. This is the whole code. So we, we have rules. Though. We cannot do something that will take more than remaining, remaining being a duration in this case. If you look at the code, let me go back. So I have my time per image, which is, which is 1 60th of a second. And I have the elapsed time, which is post minus pre on the one before last line. So the remaining time is the time I could use to do something. It's what's left in my iteration. If I go further than that, if I take more time, the next image won't be at the proper point in the next uh, cycle of, the, uh, of computation. So it's important that I don't take more time than this. That, that's a key point. So, so let's try to do something with this. <clears throat> um, the, as I said, the, the, the goal is to do something useful with that time. Now, this is a small talk. We're going to be talking for about an hour or so, and, and uh, I won't be doing anything sophisticated. So the, the point is to use that time properly with a simple example that's a bit naive, but still. So for the sake of this example, I'm going to do RLE compression. So it's a task. It's computation stuff. It's not very complicated, so it can fit in a slide, which is cool. And, and it's just just sophisticated enough to be meaningful in, let's say, in some games. It's cool for very simple pictures. So I'm going to make it simple too. I'm going to be using small 24-bit RGB values. So red, green, blue, eight bits each. Simple stuff. What is that thing? So I'm going to be using pictures now. Uh, RLE, if you don't know about it, because it's a very naive but still fun compression algorithm, it RLE stands for real uh, run length encoding. So you turn a sequence of values into pairs of how many, what, how many, what. I'll show you examples. So ideally, you are and you're going to end up in pairs. And if you, you you pairs of how many things you found and what is the value of those things, and you're trying to put together things that are equivalent. So a sequence of reds, a sequence of blues, and so on and so forth. So it works well when you have chunks of equivalent values that go together. So this is an example. If you see in the uh, in the blue blue uh, blue balloon there, before compression, I have something of length 21. It's very naive. A bunch of A's, a bunch of B's, C's, D's, whatever. After compression, I have three A's, two B's, five C's, one D, and so on and so forth. So the compressed sequence in this case is a bit shorter. 33% or so than the original one. 
So it's an okay thing. Well, it's 33% uh, of compression rate. So far, so good. Okay. So this is this is awesome. For RLE, this is perfect. Okay, this is this is beautiful. I don't know if you see it. My my, my youngest kid loves red, so I went for red. So suppose this is a five by five block. I didn't put the small lines, but see it as a five by five pixel thing. And for the sake of the demonstration, I'm going to be using R, G, and B for red, green, and blue, or, or um, to make it simpler to, to see. Okay. So let's suppose we don't care about the height and the width. We just care about the values. So we have the metadata somewhere to reproduce or reconstruct the image, but that's not what we're compressing. We're compressing the values. So this is perfect. So uncompressed, you have a 25 length 25 sequence of R's. So R, 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 there's 25 of them because it's a five by five. And if you use R compression with this, it's perfect. It means a two, two element sequence, 25 R. So try to figure that we, we represent R as an integer in this case. So this is a perfect case. RLE is probably the best you can do. It's simple, you'll say, but still. It's also a cool one. So you have a stripe of blue there, let's say five blues and 20 reds. Well, something like this already is pretty much perfect too. So you have five Bs, 20 Rs. I doubt we can really do better than this. Still okay, <clears throat> it's kind of cool. So you have four red, one blue, four red, one blue, four red, one blue. So it's nice, but you see the compression is not that good, but still, it's okay. You still got a 20% out of it. Um, you might have in mind now that if I had rotated the picture by 90 degrees before compressing, I would have gotten better results. And actual compression software does that. If you look at the uh, metadata of some of your favorite compression tools, they should use RLE sometimes for very simple pictures. And yes, they could apply transformations before the rotation, before the compression to get better results. Because this one, if you add an operation, it's much better. And, and there's the worst case, of course, for RLE compression. It's this one, this is terrible. So this is awful, 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 because you get a compressed format that's much bigger than the original. So this is terrible stuff. So far, so good. So if you look at RLE, well, what you will uh, get is something good for kid pictures. Say. So or, or, or things that have big chunks of similar colors. So a child drawing, I, I have a few children, I have five, and the young ones, they tend to do big chunks of browns and reds and blues. RLE is perfect for this. If you're using, using photographs or, or, or paintings, uh, very detailed stuff, RLE is probably far from being a good algorithm, but the point here is not to show how, how RLE is great. It's to have a simple algorithm to try to perform the task that we want to perform within a very limited time frame. So far, so good. Cool. Now we want to represent our data, like pixels or something like that. What do we want to do? We want to pick a representation that suits our needs. So <clears throat> th th there's many ways to do that. Uh, th this one is, is one case where, well, we want to use pixels and make a sequence of pixels. There's many ways to do this. The fact that we have object-oriented features in our hands that we can actually encapsulate stuff is very good here because we have many representations we can use and we can keep a proper interface on top of them such that we can adapt the representation depending on the kind of algorithms we will apply, the kind of machine we'll work on, and so on and so forth. So we can base our decisions based on what the algorithms will do and we can run tests without changing the entire user code. This is pretty awesome. So if we want to design a simple pixel class, there's many ways to do this. Let's, let's try this with code. The, 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 what I'm going to type is pretty much what's on the slides. It might not be the same all the time. Doesn't matter that much. So we want to do something like a pixel class, like this. Um, among the many representations we could use, uh, normally if we were in class, I would ask you what you think and you would be throwing things at me. <clears throat> so you could be using uh, three unsigned cars, I guess. Well, unsigned car, R, G, B. That's, that's valid, that's reasonable. We could even initialize them to zeros like this. Cool. This is okay. If we do something like this, we're going to end up with a representation that's size three and alignment one because they're all bytes. 
fair enough. We could be using an array. Array of three, RGB, say. Something like this. Three bytes. Pretty much the same thing. So size three, alignment one. Okay, nice. We could be using a four byte thing. GBA, like this. Now you might be wondering why why would someone do this? Why would someone be adding an additional byte to the representation, which makes you a size four alignment one in this case? Well, sometimes it's just because in your overall scheme, it just fits in better with the way you use the cache. It won't be playing a big role in my code today, but sometimes there are reasons to make things a bit bigger because it just avoids your objects from falling onto two cache lines at the same time, and it's just a good thing. The multiples of two, they tend to, to do a good job for this, so this would be okay. Uh, we could also be doing something like this using an integral. So uh, uh, I'm going to be using CSD int if you don't mind, because fixed size integrals are useful for this. Something like this, uh, std u int u int 32t rgba or something like this. So this this looks worse because you have a size of four and an alignment of four. So in terms of alignment, you might be losing something maybe. But the, the, the reason to pick one or the other of those representations, in our case, it will be tied to the algorithm we'll be applying. We'll be thinking about the operations we need to perform and which ones will perform best. So because in terms of cash usage, all of these are pretty much the same. We could do something else. I've used people, heard people saying they will be using strings there. That's a terrible choice. Uh, I know that in some cases, people working at Unity told me that they use floats sometimes. They have reasons for that. So, but I'm, I'm not an expert in pictures, so I won't be getting into this. So there's many cases, many choices we could use. Um, I'm going to be using this one now for simplicity, but um, it's not the best for what we're doing. It's just for the sake of the example. We could do something simple there. We could add a, say that a pixel by default is black. Something like this. We could add a parametric one. R unsigned, R G unsigned, yeah, thank you. G unsigned, car b that's it and initialize them r with r g with g b with b or something like this i hope they're written properly there we go and this could be context per so no problem life is good with us And we could say, well, maybe I would like to know the red, the green, the blue. So we could have member functions like this auto, whoops, const expert, auto, red, something like this, const, no except, blah, 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 return r, et cetera, et cetera. The things we will probably want to really implement, though, are uh, ways to compare pixels together because we're going to try to count the number of uh, equivalent pixels that are one besides the other. So we're going to be comparing them with equal equal or different from or so, something like that. So uh, something like this say will be key for us. Const expert boo or greater la la const pixel other, const no except this one needs to be efficient because it's going to be used quite a lot. We're going to be comparing pixels all the time because we're counting the like the pixels that are alike one besides the other. So with the representation I use now, it's going to look something like this. Like let's compare the reds. So, and the same. And and I would need to compare the greens and the blues. Let's make it quick. Green could be nicer like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I keep getting phone calls, I'm sorry. So something like this, the blues, the green, other dot green, and the blues. This is not exactly the most efficient way to do things, probably, because I'm doing a lot of comparisons in this one. There's like five in the worst case. 
So maybe if we're going to do that quite a lot, we would prefer a representation that makes comparing objects easier or faster. I'm going to compile for C++20 if you don't mind. I should have done that before we started the talk. I just didn't think about it. Give me a second. By default, this tool uses C++14. There we go. With C++20, we don't need to, to implement operator different from because it's synthesized by equal equal, so it's implicit. The other thing that we will need to do quite a bit is have an integer representation because we were going to want to turn the sequence of pixels into a sequence of how many, what, how many, what. So the easiest way to do this is just have integers all over the place. <clears throat> so something like this, const expert operator stb u int 32t um, const. And now the actual value we're going to get is not that important. But what is important is that for two pixels with the same red, green, and blue, I arrive at the same integer value because I want to be able to compare them together easily and, and, and find them afterwards. So anything that's kind of reasonable would work. So probably something like this. Uh, let's put, let's say the red, whoops, red. With a bitwise or and the blue, like this by eight, uh, and uh, by 16, and the green in the middle there. So these are all integers. When using bitwise operations, parentheses are your friends because the order, the priority of these operations is, is, is a bit screwy. So we have the baseline of a simple pixel class, and as long as we maintain the interface, we're pretty much okay if we want to write code. So this should be one way to do this. So uh, we have an implicit operator like this because that's C plus plus twenty. There we go. With it's simple, but it should do the job. So if we return to the the code, if you look at the code, you'll see a number of examples like this. They're all pretty much equivalent. So we just we just did together like this. So we're going to choose one. I'm going to pick the one I used now because I don't want to do many, <clears throat> but normally you would look at the size. They are pretty much the same in this case, three, four bytes. The risk of a pixel falling into two cache lines, especially if you're going to write to them, it's not a worry in our case. And the most frequently used operations, now in our case, this is the key thing. It is the key things, uh, but um, in general, the other two aspects are more important. Now we want to implement our algorithm. This is what we want to do. So let's go back to this. If you want to compress stuff, I'm going to do something very simple. I'm going to use a vector because vectors are nice, of course, as we all know. I'm going to turn a, an array, an array, a vector of pixels into a vector of integers. Something like this. Vector of cd u int 32t. This will be my output. Let's call that uh, RLE compression. A const std vector of pixels. Of pix. There we go. The key thing, this one is simple. You pass it a vector, it computes something, it returns a vector. And I'm seeing this the, the time go, go by. I think I'm going to go back to the slide just to make sure we don't miss time. Okay, uh, I'm scared that I'm going to go overboard. The code kind of looks like this. So if we look at it step by step, the first thing is the signature. It's simple. That's quite a nice quality for code. The key operations are those you see there. So we're going to compare pixels together quite a bit. So the different from operator is important. And when we put the uh, how many what pairs in the vector in the end, we're going to use the conversion to an unsigned integer quite a bit. But this will happen a lot less often for proper RLE pictures, let's put it this way, uh, than the comparison. We're going to compare many times and convert a few times. And if you look at the code we have, that's pretty much what we're going to do. So optimizing for the small red, green, blue members, it's not that essential. That is uh, that essential. So, we could gather from this that if we had picked the representation that's an unsigned integer, it would probably be faster because comparing unsigned integers, it's straightforward, and converting to an unsigned integer is, of course, trivial. 
because there's nothing to do. Construction of the pixel will be longer, but the code we're looking at right now does not construct pixels at all. Now, if you look at this, the idea of the algorithm is simple. I start with a base. I'm at position zero in my vector, and then the current point is the one just after, because I'm looking for a pixel that's different from the initial one. When I find something different, I push back two things. The number of pixels I have found that were the same, and the value of the pixel that I was comparing to. So the initial one in this case. And once I'm done, my new base is where I stopped because where I stopped was the pixel that was different. Now, if you look at the code, it's quite simple. In fact, at the end, you need a last uh, bit of operation there because the last sequence you will have found uh, won't be detected by the loop because the loop, when you reach the end, of course, it reaches the end of the source, but it doesn't see anything different from the last pixel by definition. So there's a last bit that you need to do at the end. Otherwise, there will be missing pieces. But I like this algorithm because it's simple. It fits in a slide, really. And it works, by the way. So far, so good. Now, it works, but it's not suitable. <clears throat> it, it's probably optimal. In fact, it's very fast. If you look at this, you can probably not go faster than this with anything naive. You could do weird tricks with assembly language, but the overall idea is, it, the overall idea is probably much as, as good as it gets. We cannot use it. Look at this thing. There's things that are preventing us from using this algorithm. These, these are bad for us because we're calling pushback. We could be calling in place back. That's not the point. The point is pushback is order of one, so it's a constant time algorithm, but it's constant time amortized, and sometimes it will reallocate. And if it reallocates, you cannot guarantee anymore that you will meet your constraints, because if you give yourself a ceiling as to the time that you have in your hands, allocating is undeterministic by default. You could, of course, write deterministic allocation algorithms for specific cases, but in general, it's not what you're getting. So you cannot guarantee that you will meet your matrix in this case, because it's going to be fast on average, but this is real-time systems. It's the worst case you want to see. That in general thing kills us. The other problem is, well, you might you might want to reserve the memory right away. It's tempting. I mean, I'm going to make a big reserve at the beginning. You have two problems with this. The first one is it's still an allocation. So if you need to allocate and it takes you over the time you had, you're still you're still stuck. And how much would you reserve? If you don't know the nature of the data in picks in your, your argument there, you're going to need to go for the worst case. And the worst case is twice the size of the original source. So you're going to need to be very pessimistic. It may be costly. The other thing is it's a linear uh, complexity algorithm because you're going through every pixel. So you're stuck with being dependent on the size of your input. Now, if you have a limited amount of time, you might go overboard. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because you cannot guarantee that you will meet your time constraints. So it's good, but it's not usable within the restrictions and constraints that we have. We need, if we want to use this kind of algorithm in the situation where we are, we have to change it. Okay. We have to make sure it doesn't run too long, because if it runs too long, well, you're not doing your job. Running too long is complex, so you want the caller to provide you with enough information so that you know when to stop. It can mean many things. How many iterations is the color giving me? That's a bit tricky sometimes because the color has to know how long an iteration will take. It's not always feasible in practice. You can have a deadline saying you shall not run for longer than this, and the color would probably insert a small time buffer there to make sure it doesn't go overboard. You can also equivalently say this is how much time I'm giving you. Do not go over that. I personally like pre predicates. So in my mind, the easiest way to do things is pass a predicate, a Boolean function 
to the algorithm, and the algorithm would call that function at timely points. Say, can I continue? Yeah. Can I continue? Yeah. Can I continue? No. And then you stop and you get out. If you can do that, you let the caller decide on what the proper rules for continuation are. <clears throat> and if the caller prefers one way or another, it's his or her thing. That's kind of cool. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Now, if you want to make progress, there's another thing. You need to know where you stopped the last time you were stopped in order to continue the next time you're being called. So you want to pursue where you were stopped last time. So we need to change the signature to take that into account because we were just returning a vector. Doesn't work. This will make for a more complex signature. And, and we need to be deterministic because if you do anything that is undeterministic inside your function, you cannot give any guarantee. So allocating is out. Um, doing IO is out for the same reason. So you, you cannot do those things. So there's a consequence to that. The consequence is that the caller has to supply the buffer. Because if you are allocating inside, it's already too late. Because you don't control the time it's going to take. <clears throat> so if the caller supplies you the buffer into which you will write, and of course the input source, well, the caller controls the uh, allocation wherever it happens, if it happens, maybe it's pre-allocated, whatever, maybe it's reusing the same buffer all over the place. So since the caller controls, it's not your responsibility. So you can do something in deterministic time and respect your constraints. So the signature adjusted would look kind of like this. It's more complex, it's more complex. So there's more arguments to the, the more parameters to the template and more arguments to the function. So if you compare, the first one was simpler, but it kind of makes sense, you know. The first thing, you need an input range. <clears throat> now I'm going, I'm, I'm using range here, but I'm replaying with iterators. Okay, this is suitable for iterators more probably than ranges because ranges, you want something that is self-contained with its beginning and end sentinel or something. I really want to work step by step in this case. Uh, I could make it with ranges, but wouldn't necessarily be, be simpler. So I have the beginning of the source and the end of the source. Begin, end of something by default. Uh, the beginning of the source will progress over time, or so we hope, because we're trying to compress stuff as we go along. And when I return, I will return where I am in order to be fed that value later, such that I can continue from that point on. So I expect the end of the source to be stable and the beginning of the source to change over time. I need the beginning of the destination buffer. So th this could be anything that the caller has supplied into which I can write without allocating, at least not explicitly in my algorithm. So a pre-allocated buffer of something, whatever. The caller is responsible for the size. If you're feeling that this is dangerous, well, there are non-dangerous ways of doing this. I'm going to be do doing one, but if you want something that is respectful of time constraints, you're going to need to pre-allocate the space. And the predicate will be there. So I'm going to be using a function, Boolean function supplied by the caller that tells me if I can continue. It could be a stop predicate. I'm going to be using a continuation predicate. If it returns true, it means you can continue. Ideally, this function would be stateless. It won't be in my example because I want something very simple. Okay? But ideally, it would be stateless in the sense that uh, you want to be able to call that function as often as you want and get a proper result. If it's counting the number of times you called it, it becomes sensitive to when you called it and how frequently you do. So ideally, it would be something stateless in general, but again, my example would be too simple to show that. This would generally be bad, <clears throat> okay? but as you will see, it's pretty much what I'm going to be doing later, but still. So a lambda that takes an <clears throat> integer n, if it's positive, decrement set says, hey, hey, everything's good. And if it gets to zero, well, just return false saying you, you have used your time slot, your, your, the available time you had, sorry for the noise. So this works, but it's kind of awkward because if I call it often, <clears throat> I will complete sooner than if I call it less often. Yeah. We will return a pair, a pair of where I stopped reading 
and where I stopped, writing, because both are important if I want to continue computation on the next call at the same positions in both the input and the output sequence. The caller will supply me at a later time the values I have returned at the previous time. This allows my function to remain stateless, otherwise I would need to do a functor that keeps state. That's not necessarily a good idea in this case, even though it could be made to work. The, de the degenerate case at the beginning is the empty sequence, which could happen. Uh, somebody could be supplying to you a beginning and end of sequence that are equal because it's an empty sequence and just complicates code to check it out. So if there's nothing to do, well, nothing is moving. The beginning of the sequence will be the same and the beginning of the destination will be the same. That's fair. The main idea of the algorithm remains the same. So I'm using iterators in this case. In the previous example, I was using indices, but I could have used iterators too. So my base is the beginning of the source. Now I'm going to the next one. The plus plus BS in the for loop is what we have in mind. So I'm advancing one step. I could be using next or advance or whatever. Now, if the predicate says you shall not continue, then I stop. That's the first line in the for loop right now. Returning base because I didn't make progress at that point. So and my beginning of the source will be where it was last time. Well, with the base value because it could have evolved along the way. The second if, which would be called quite often, is if I found at some point a value, a pixel in our case, that is different from the first one, my baseline. Ah, if I did, then I'm putting how many I found and what the value was. I'm presuming in this case that the pixels or the source values are convertible to integers. I could have asserted that with the concept or requires clause or enable a for static assert or whatever. <clears throat> and once I have kept how many I had and what it was, I put my base to the beginning of the next sequence such that I can continue next time. It's the same idea as the original one. The real addition is that if there that says, well, if you have exceeded the time you had, let's stop there to continue at a later point. It's, it's a choice that has impacts because I might not be making progress over many calls. Because if I'm trying to progress and I'm never meeting a pixel that is different from day base one, let's have a long sequence and a little amount of time, I might not progress over time. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Well, in general, it doesn't matter because I'm preparing stuff for the future, trying to help the system along. The key part of the loop in which this function is being called is the one displaying images. I'm preparing stuff for the future to make the system more fluid. It doesn't matter if I progress slowly. As long as I progress a bit from time to time, that's cool. <clears throat> I could have put it there. I could have said, well, once I have found an entire sequence, I will see if I have to continue. If I do this, so I insert the predicate call inside the if instead of just before it. That means that I'm always going to do at least one subsequence of the input. The bad side of this is that if that sequence is long, I might exceed the time I had. So it's doable to ensure progress at every call, but there's a cost to that. I could do it this way too and saying, OK, well, when the predicate says, no, you shall not continue, I'm going to take whatever I did. I at least advanced one per call because I did plus plus on BS at the beginning of the for loop. So if I do that, I'm going to have a lower quality compression. It's OK. So I might have something like three reds, two Rs, instead of having five Rs, but three Rs, two Rs instead of five Rs because I got stopped after three iterations once. And when I came back, there were still two others to do. So it's an improper compression. It's not invalid. It's just lower quality. But I would progress. I could end up with a bad compression, but it would progress. It could compensate. <clears throat> so uh, it's been suggested to me, and that's true, that if we have, and we know we're going to have some sometimes, a lower quality compression because we made that choice, 
we could have a post-processing step that does much faster compression by recompressing the RLE sequence and compacting uh, two contiguous sequences of the same values with different how many. So we could do a post-processing that will help stuff along. So that would be an option. That's not what I'm going to do today because that's not the point of the, the, the talk, but it's a possibility. Yeah. And again, the, when we, uh, we we reach the end of the loop, the last sequence at the end of the source has to be taken into account because there's always going to be at the end at least one pixel you didn't count in the sequence, presuming you're doing pixels. Now, I don't have to put an if around this thing because the operations I have there are constant time, so they can be taken into account by the caller when preparing the predicate, saying, well, at the end, there's always a two-step computation to do, but it's like very, very quick, so that's okay. So yeah, I, I left a link there, so when I give the slides, if you want to play with it, the entire code is there and compiles, okay? So uh, it's a GCC thing, but you can use the compiler you want. How do you use this thing now? Because you have a more complex function than you used to. Again, I have a whole, the, the link has the whole code with client code. Client code kind of looks like this. This is the basic thing. So I, 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 I did well. I could just open it up there. Give me a second. Let's just take the link and look at it. It's more fun to play with it. There we go. Let's take an actual, yeah, sorry for the, the noise there. There we go. This is code that compiles, so why don't you use it? So as you can see, I used, I hope, I hope the, the font size is big enough. So I used a pixel class. In this, this one, I used an array, okay? Doesn't really matter. So I have operator per, uh, equal equal and the conversion to UN32. I have an RLE compression. That's pretty much what we saw. It's the cool code. And I have the divisible version that's pretty much the same size, but with a more complex signature. Okay. So the slide we're looking at has this bit of code there. I chose, I spoke with students to be honest, and so I told them, what kind of picture do you want to see? And they said, well, there's green, there's blue, there's yellow. So, so that, this is what I did. So I put a number of uh, green pixels at first, 10. Lines 74, 74, 75. I put a bunch of blues, four. So lines 76, 77. And I put the number of reds. So then I put six there, line 78, 79. Just to make sure there's a small blob of colored things. I displayed what they would look like before compression because it's nice to have a baseline. You look at this, okay, I expect this. I know what I'm going to get. So I'm taking every pixel by value. This is like lazy code. I'm outputting the hex set width set fill there. I'm outputting the values in hexadecimal format so that we can see them properly. You'll see the results in a few seconds. And I'm casting my pixels to an unsigned integers to display the actual integral value there. So you'll see this in a second. So if I go there, sorry, let's go from this point on. Comparing, comparing, comparing. It will be something like this. So as you can see, you'll see the hexadecimal values, and there's a number of like values. The first few are 00, zero FF00. Zero, zero. There's 10 of these, I think. It's, it ends around this area there. And then there's four that are like, these four there that are, I think, blues or greens, whatever. And, and the last one's there. Okay. So the set width and set fill is just for display stuff. I could have used more modern display, but it doesn't really matter. This is what we have so far. We compress the thing. This is simple, see? It's just a function call, which is lovely. But as I said, it cannot be held to guarantee the respect of time constraints. The assert that follows is because I'm convinced that I have an even number of values in my uh, vector because I'm putting in there how many, what, how many, what. They always come by pairs. The assert is just a sanity check to make sure I'm okay because in my loop afterwards, I'm using i plus equals two. Sorry for the noise. So I'm displaying as an integral the number of elements 
and as an hexadecimal value, the pixel, which is what you see in this case. So it's a single call compression. It's good to have a baseline that works. So if you compare with the code we have there, traditional, easy, blah, and shows like this, 10 of the first one, four of the second one, six of the third one. It's important to have this because this algorithm is easier to understand. So you want to make sure that your complex one works too. So this should give the same results if everything works fine, you know, presuming that you're not going for a lower quality compression. So far, so good. Once you have this, you have something that works. Simple. The call that you see there is more complex. Now, this is the divisible version. It's the same code as on the uh, one box. I'll go back to it. If we go to the one box there, I'm using for the sake of the example, very simple sake, a back inserter as output buffer. So if you're not familiar with back inserter, what it does is when you write to it, it does a pushback. So if you're telling me, no, 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 Pat, you said you should not use pushback because it allocates, Ooh. The thing is, the function, the algorithm has to respect time constraints, so it has to be strict. I'm showing that the algorithm can be made to work. Now the caller, if it doesn't care about allocating or not, can pretty much do what he wants. In this case, the called function is not allocating to the best of its knowledge. The caller is responsible for what's going on. So if I had decided instead of a back inserter to allocate a buffer, once and use it, it will work. It will work too. I was just making a small example. And what does my function do? Well, until I'm done, I advance it. So the call takes BS, first argument there. It's the beginning of the source. The end doesn't move. The beginning of the destination, I'm playing it as if it's moving, even though it's not really moving. And the predicate I'm using is, well, you have 12 iterations to progress and then it's done. Why did I put 12? It's because I wanted a small example. Remember, I have 10, 4, 6. So the first block of 10 will go with the first iteration. The second block of 4 won't be doable because I won't have enough quote, quote, time to do the thing. So it's going to abandon in the middle of the second block of four elements. When I call it back, it's going to start at the beginning of the block of four elements, do those four, and then do the six after, and I'm going to be OK because it's a very, very small picture I'm doing. To show it works, I added a little C out there just to show that I'm making a dot every time I'm being called. Since we have 12 pixels, a sequence of 10, a sequence of four, a sequence of six, I will have 20 pixels. Well, going forward by blocks of 12 means two calls will be sufficient. Of course, if I had a sequence of more than 12 elements consecutive, I would be in trouble with this algorithm. It wouldn't work. You know? If it works, once I'm done, I still have an even number of elements. And if I display them, I expect to have the same results. It's more complex, but it's interesting in the sense that it respects the quote unquote time constraints given. It never allocates within the algorithm itself. So it's predictable within the boundaries of what the caller provides. Sorry. What we just looked at with examples and, and explanations. We have the code there that will insert. We're kind of keeping track of where we are as destination. Doesn't really matter in this case. I'm calling the thing in a loop and progressing my beginning of the source every time I'm moving about. For those not familiar with it, the auto square bracket thing is a structured binding. It's very useful. It binds the both elements of the pair to different variables. Uh, the mutable and the lambda is because I'm decrementing n, and the lambdas are cons by default. Yeah. And this is just to show progress. So if you look at the display at the end, I have an even number of elements. And you see the two dots at the top? That's because I made two iterations through the loop because I progressed by steps. And happily enough, I get the same result at the end, which is encouraging. I could do something different if I had made different choices. And indeed, if you look at the one box link, this is what you're going to get. It's copied and pasted. Here we go. 
So hopefully this was understandable a bit. The link is again the same. So what does it mean slowing down to be faster? Because I'm not faster in this case. My algorithm is actually slower than the base one. Uh, we, we ended up with a slower algorithm than the original and more complex. So, so why would I make my life complicated? You know, why make a slower algorithm that's more complex than the base one that works? They both get the same result. But the thing is, we have this small time frame at the end, and it's what we're trying to inscribe ourselves in. Sometimes you have to uh, do artificial intelligence to move enemies around, but you have a limit, limited amount of time and you're going to get interrupted. If you're doing planning that takes more than one iteration of your loop to do, you're never going to do any planning if you don't find a way to either run the different thread for your AI, but that's not always possible, or make it work step by step. Sometimes it's useful to do that. So I'm trying to fit in that time frame. So from the perspective of the algorithm, we are slower. We can be a little slower and we can be a lot slower. That's true because we could not make, make progress over a long period of time if we're not lucky. But for the system, we're more efficient because our key thing is the loop that has to display pictures. And we're trying to make the system better by making bits of the loop that were unused do part of the work. So we're leveraging the time we have to do something useful. If we're sleeping, the code still works, but at some point you might have to pause in the future to do the things we didn't get to do before. Now you might be asking, this is old style code, what about coroutines? Coroutines look good to me because they can be stopped and resumed after a while. And you're right, coroutines are a good fit for this, except for a little thing. So if you're not familiar with coroutines, I am going to be using experimental slash coroutine stuff because I didn't want to write the entire scaffolding myself. They're a bit raw these days, coroutines. They work well, but you have to write a lot of code to make it work. Uh, so they are resumable functions. You start them, you can yield, and go back to where you were when you last stopped executing a function. So they're pretty much fitting with the mindset that we have. But but there's a trick there. So look at this. <clears throat> this this supposes a generator. So generators will be standardized at some point. We're working on the details. Uh, so suppose something will return some state. The state is passed initially, and it will be generating values. In my case, the state is an integer. I'm just very very simple example. And there's a predicate there to see if I can continue or not. Again, same technique. If you look at the loop. I'm, I'm doing an infinite loop and I'm returning values all the time. So suppose that the sleep for 100 milliseconds is a very important task. Replace this by an important function that I need to do. It's important for me that this is being done. OK. And, and there, there's some residual, residual stuff that I can do at the end too. So when, once I'm there, I'm incrementing a value that's important. The co yields that you see there are the points where I need to stop computing and I'm returning the value or the state where I am. So these are two moments where I could be stopped, suspended. And if I'm called again, I will continue from that point on. So it does make the code a lot simpler if you look at it, because you can be suspended at chosen points in your computation and you let the next call will not resume at the beginning of the function but at the point right after the co yield that you had cool so it kind of makes things easier but the thing is the predicate <clears throat> so if you're passing a calling a coroutine the arguments are passed only on the first call after that the states the state within the coroutine is maintained uh, by an automaton and it's allocated somewhere and it's reused so if i'm passing a predicate that knows for example the time that i have to compute well that time will not necessarily be refreshed on the next call because if the predicate returned false and it's the same predicate on the next call to the coroutine because we're not restarting from the beginning we're starting from the yield point well if your predicate is stateful which it probably will be 
And if it's keeping values inside as a copy, well, you'll be already expired properly by that point. So this is calling code. It's much simpler than what we had, but it's very, very, like, it's very naive. Okay. If you look at this thing, so the deadline, I'm saying, well, I'm giving you at most 150 milliseconds from the point where I computed the deadline to do your thing. And my predicate in this case will, when called, read the clock and say, say have I exceeded the deadline I've been giving, given? Look at the capture block. I can I get the line by reference in this case, not by value. Because if I got it by value, the value would be persisted inside and it would never change. So once the deadline would have been um, uh, expired, it would it would remain expired forever. <clears throat> so that's not what I want to do in this case. The coroutine code there is the four auto generators. They behave, they behave kind of like a range. So I'm taking every integer n or every state n in this case uh, until, well, until there's none left. In my code, that's very simple. After 10, I stop though. So the predicate is passed only on the first call. It's not passed afterwards. But reach this point in this case, I'm resetting or reinitializing the deadline with a new value. Because it's by reference in the lambda, the lambda will be able to use that new value on the next resuming point of the coroutine when I go back to the beginning of the loop. Because I'm not going to call the coroutine from the beginning, it's going to be from the inside. So it's a bit tricky because you have to pay attention to lifetime management. It's very important because if your coroutine lives for longer than the state it holds, you're going to be in trouble like for many such uh, um, pass by reference cases. Yeah. Pretty much what you end up with. So uh, I didn't write a conclusion, a conclusion slide, but the point there is this. So you can write algorithms that go fast, and sometimes that's what you want to do. When you're stuck in a small time frame, you can make them divisible using coroutines or manual techniques, and make sure that you can progress by small steps. In this way, you can make your whole system better if your inferior function is not. Hopefully, it was fun. Sir Klaus, that would be it. I'm trying to give you back your screen, though I don't know how to do it. All right. All right. I'm thank hoping you, this is okay. Cool. You're in control. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Thank you very much. I now hear myself. I now hear myself. Thank you. Thank you. Mute something, something or, or uh, somehow this. What have I done? You have to do something. something. Okay. okay. So either way, so either way, there is a couple of a questions. Couple. So one of the questions has been asked very early. Uh, indeed, very early, slide 13. So if you could uh, share the slides again, we could go I'm back there. i do this right away, my friend. Give me a second. Yes, perfect. So now you see yourself, but I'm going to stop that. So no 13, problem. you said, I'm going to remove your face. No, it's not ready, but 13, let's go back. Sorry for the blandness of the slides, but it's made with love. <laughs> All right, so 13, great. Um, so it, it was an early question, but still, um, let me ask it, and perhaps there is a couple of um, additional summaries that you have. Mm -hmm. So how, how easy it is to switch the computation of these additional tasks out of the loop if the time constraint cannot be met anymore? And also, uh, what, oh, sorry. Sorry, are you talking about the one in bold face or something else? So I, I just read the, the question as it was asked. Uh, I think this is this is it, however. So um, initially it was not quite clear how easy it is to indeed um, deal with um, yeah, cutting a bigger task into smaller pieces. You've now shown one example. Perhaps the, the next part of the question um, extends that. What different methods for switching are available? Is it just the one that, that you showed or are there more? Oh, well, the, 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 um, historically speaking, there's many ways to do this. Um, when, when, when I was younger and I did a lot of C code, um, the, we, we had students working on conveyor belts with single threaded code that was subject to interruptions and they had complex tasks to do. 
so they added limited time to do the thing. So entering the function, they would keep a static integral uh, value uh, inside the function, so that such that it kept its called sorry from call to call, and then entering the function, they would do a switch on that value and jump to the case representing the last step in the computation they had not managed to complete and restart the step anew. So they went from step zero to one to two to three to four and in the end returned to step zero. The thing is if you are entering the function you're moving through the entire step two say and you're still not interrupted you increment your number of step to three and then you start step three and then if you're done with that you increment to step four and so on and so forth when you're stopped in the integer value you add within the function you remember in a sense the last point when you were stopped on the previous call of course you're single threaded so when you're called again you can resume by returning to the beginning of the last step that was begun and not completed so that's one way old school to do this you could uh, separate tasks using, of course, multi-threading and, and, and the thread pool and stuff, but that might not be sufficient for the kind of thing that I had in mind writing this, because if you're doing a multi-threaded computation, separating chunks into multiple threads, you're going to require synchronization, and your deterministic characteristics might not be met. So it really depends on the use cases that you have. All right. I hope I'm answering um, properly, otherwise just ask again. Exactly. Um, so it's slide 27. Uh, you showed the application of the RLE, which does not yield a particularly great result. Um, Indeed. Uh, first, 27, this one. Um, the question was, does it make sense to apply RLE twice? Or does it any ever make sense to apply RLE twice to compress further? That, that's interesting. <clears throat> you would need metadata to know how many times you've applied it, I guess. Uh, I'm not an, an, a compression expert. The, the point was not, uh, co the compression there was just an example to make things fun and vis visual. <clears throat> so I'm guessing you could do that, uh, but you would really have to ask someone who does compression quite a bit more than I do. For me, it's just a naive example to, to talk about something else. Uh, what you could definitely do in this case, if you add a layer of <clears throat> overall common management for your compression algorithms and you have a, a toolbox of compression algorithms like the main tools that exist like 7-Zip and Zip and R, uh, RAR and whatever, they do many things. You could say, well, first let's rotate by 90 degrees, as I said, and then compress with RLD is going to be tremendous. But with such a simple example, I didn't want to get into that kind of stuff. It's just possible to do it. Okay. All right, and, and then there's a question about output operators. Okay. Uh, it's not clear which slide it was. Might have been slide 30 or 80. I think you're going to find one. The output operators. 80. But uh, the question is, how do you ensure that a caller passes you an output iterator that can be incremented and written to as many times as uh, as, as it probably yields false? Ah, oh, that's fun. That's fun. Okay. So first of all, you, you can't. <clears throat> you can because the output return you could you could okay that, that, that that's another talk entirely but it's fun if you're looking at iterators at least in the traditional sense so pre-ranges you have uh, uh, can, can can i do a picture i hope you don't mind me doing pictures uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna try to make it quick i'm okay. going to use this i'm gonna try to make something very very quick so maybe two minutes or something yeah. So, so let's hope it starts. So you have, basically speaking, traditionally speaking, you have five uh, species of iterators at your disposal. Let's make small blocks like this. And sorry for the French interface, but I have French students. So let's do this. Whoops, come here. So you have the two basic ones that are very weird. You have the input, I'm going to make it bigger, don't worry. Iterator. Mm -hmm. So these are those you will use if you want to do single pass algorithms. You could be reading from the keyboard or from a network stream or something. So you can progress one at a time through the sequence, but you cannot guarantee that if you progress a second time, you will get the same results because there's no guarantee that a human at the keyboard would type the same thing twice. You have your output iterators that are very strange beasts. They don't know where they are. 
they don't know what you're talking about. They just jump. It's like a blind Pac-Man going through a, a maze. It's going forward, doesn't know what it's doing. It forgets what it did before. So output generators typically they, they have no sense of where they are, and and writing to them essentially always works, even if it doesn't work, and nobody cares. So the color in the sense of the uh, the code I was showing is responsible to supply something. The function cannot generally speaking, guarantee that the output iterator is correct, it could just be a pointer to a buffer. So it's a caller responsibility. We're not talking about security, we're talking about respecting time constraints. And then you have the other three that are more used in practice by most people. Whoops, sorry. You have the forward iterators. Think about a, a forward list, for example. So you can make a pass from beginning to end, and if it suits you, you can do another pass, another pass, another pass. As long as you don't modify the data, you're going to get the same thing. And you get the bidirectional, bidirectional iterators. You can go forward and backward by one step at a time. And you've got the random access iterators like arrays and vectors that are very quick. You can advance and go back by as many steps as you want in constant time. So this thing there is important. They're all like refinements of one another. A forward is an input. A bidirectional is a forward, and a random access is a bidirectional, and we're using that for optimization library. But when you're at the upper stage there, you've got very weak beasts that can do many things, but are not very knowledgeable. So these beasts in particular, you can write to them, you can go forward, and that's pretty much it. If you go back to the algorithm we have there, we don't know what the color is giving us, but if the color is giving us something bad, the color is responsible for the problem. We don't have time to prevent anything in this case because we have a task to do and we have limited time to do it. So we know in general we cannot prevent the color from doing something stupid. Is that answering properly? I believe so. <laughs> I, I hope so. Else, please, please ask again. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I'm looking if there's any more questions. Um, as long as there's no hate mail, that's okay. No, there is not. So there is a lot of thank you. There no. is nothing bad. Phew. I don't see anything bad. It was made with love. I don't know if you heard it, but there's a lot of love in there. All right. But I think this is all the questions. The rest seems to be primarily, um, primarily comments on on what you said, etc. Okay. okay, Ben, thank you very much. This was a great talk. I thank think uh, a lot of people agree. Some people say this work. So um, thank you very much indeed. But now, of course, you might still have a couple of more questions. A couple of questions about. Um, how these algorithms work, more detailed questions that might not fit in, in in the chat. If you want to meet our speakers, then you're of course very welcome to join us in the after talk chat. I just posted the Twitch link. Uh, it's only a Twitch link, the Zoom link. <laughs> it, is a, it is a Zoom meeting. Um, so uh, if you want to join us, please feel free to do so. Both Patrice and also Killian will be there. Okay, then else have a great rest of the evening or a great day. Uh, depending on your time zone. And we might see each other again next month in May. Okay. Thank you. Bye.